right. Webinar is being recorded. Craig, it's up to you. The appointed hour of six o'clock has been reached. I welcome everyone to this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals. My name is Craig Meadows. At the request of Steve Judge, Chair of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals, who is unable to make tonight's meeting, I call this meeting to order as the acting chair. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended again by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Additionally, the meeting recordings may be viewed via the Town of Amherst YouTube channel and ZBA webpage. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when the, when the public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing nine on your telephone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the Zoning Board of Appeals Chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. In accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Law Chapter 40A and Article 10, special permit granting authority and the of the Amherst Zoning by law, the public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties in at interest. We'll begin with the roll call of the regular members of the ZBA. First, myself, Craig Meadows here. John Gilbert. Present. Everald Henry. Here. Associate member David Slovatar. Here. Also in attendance are Rob Wachilla, planner and ZBA staff liaison, Christine Bestra, Planning Director, and any other town staff you will see on the call. At the moment, I don't see any others. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 48 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. One of the more specific elements of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw is Section 10.38. Specific findings from this section must be made for all of our decisions. All hearings, are, uh, hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff. The procedure will be as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing after which the board will ask questions for clarification and additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raise hand function on their screen. The chair with the assistance of the staff will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, present your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally, normally hold public hearings where information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it is ha, does it has enough time, information, it will decide the applications tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own member merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily, for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of the hearing to file a decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of the filing to file its decision. No decision is final until a written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed with the town clerk's office. 
Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there is a 20 day appeal period for an aggrieved party to contest the decision with a relevant judicial body in superior court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded at the Registry of Deeds to take effect. Tonight's agenda. Public meeting, a roll call of public minute, minutes and a public no previous minutes, meeting minutes to approve at this time. Uh, ZBA FY 2018-9, um, Sarah Craig, 100 North Prospect Street, to enact condition 18, which states any substantial changes to the project shall return to the Zoning Boards of Appeal as a public meeting. The applicant is proposing to slightly expand and move in addition to the building. Is there anyone here representing uh, this petitioner? Rob, yes. I think you've yep. got that. Yep, so I'm going to promote two individuals who raised their hands, and they should be accepting and joining as panelists very shortly. Hello. Hello. Could you so please cut identify out your... as I was promoted here? So I hope I didn't miss anything too important. But uh, I'm Kyle. I'm a uh, project manager for Integrity. And uh, in... your last name, Kyle? Kyle Belanger. Yep. Kyle Belanger, project manager at Integrity. And uh, Nicole Weatherell is also here with me from Integrity. Um. We're here representing Sally Craig, who could not be in attendance tonight um, on her project. And uh, I guess if now's the appropriate time, I, I guess I'd like to present the changes to the previous uh, ZBA decision. So you do have um, <clears throat> screen share capabilities as a panelist. So if either one of you wanted to share your screen, you can go ahead and do so. I do, and here we go. This is where I get to show off my Luddite side of myself and trying to share everything via Zoom. So hopefully it goes smoothly. Um, I have everything here, <clears throat> the plans that we, we submitted. Um, I also have a summary of changes, but I guess just to kind of give you a quick rundown of, of what it is that we're talking about, um, you'll see the actual um, in the center of the screen, the addition as proposed, and then you can see the the remaining or the existing structure, which was built, um, completed back in 2019. Um, also on here, the sections that say living room and no work to second floor, that's all existing. <clears throat> the previous uh, zoning board decision approved the, the addition actually um, further up the page, so further north than what's shown here, and the footprint is is slightly different. Um, it is a library, but it is also intended to be a bedroom um, with bathroom and closet for the um, uh, the parents of Sally, who is moving there um, as an aging in place accommodation for them. They currently live in the addition and. The original intent of um, this addition and the intent still is for for the parents. Um, unfortunately, one of which um, over the weekend who was in the most need of it um, passed away over the weekend. So it's we still intend on moving forward for um, her mother, um, although her father's not in consideration anymore. So. Um, so it will be a bedroom for her. Um, the arrangement right now and the reason why it, it actually kind of had to move um, to actually be viable. Um, if you have driven by um, or have looked at any pictures of the structure, the front of the building essentially is on the top of the page right now. That's where there's a, a walkway that's tied to the building. Um, it's the side that faces the street. On the right, 
just off page is where the driveway comes up to it. And um, the nature of the, the building itself is to be as low threshold and zero barrier for entrance as possible. So um, the ability to actually have vents for mechanical equipment, both for the propane exhaust and intake, as well as ERV exhaust and intake, um, all of those things sort of found themselves in a design build fashion during construction um, on the left side of the structure, the um, west side of the building, which is where the addition was actually proposed of being. Um, so the installing or building the new addition in that location was going to be cost prohibitive and maybe not even feasible, um, just based on where all those things had to be. So we did move it further south as shown. <clears throat> the overall size has also changed. Um, there was a little bit of a change between the last zoning board um, decision and when the building permit went through. The uh, ZBA approved an overall structure of 2,220 square feet. Um, and the addition got a little bit smaller last time, the main addition that was built in 2019. Um, and therefore, the new addition got a little bit larger. However, the overall footprint is still one square foot less than the original structure that was approved, um, just based on layout and how it worked for. Honestly, it was uh, decisions that were made before I, I really got involved when Kuhn Riddle um, presented this to the board. Um, what else? What else? The walls um, are a little bit taller than what was previously proposed. Uh, the structure actually had a shed roof um, where it attached to the main building, and it was of a different pitch than the, the main building. Um, what we're proposing now is a gable roof of the same pitch. And as opposed to the last time it was proposed where the the ridges were perpendicular to each other or the eaves are perpendicular to each other. Now they're going to be parallel too. So in my opinion, at least a little bit more cohesive of a roof plan or a roof line. Um, the walls got a little bit taller and this was um, of primary interest to the homeowner because on the, um, the side that I'm showing here, the elevation detail two on page A5 on the right side of the page, um, those windows are up high. Um, when it's being used as a bedroom, um, if you were to look out those windows, there actually is a, a rental. Um, I guess it can be a little bit noisy at times, and there's the parking lot for that rental right there as well. So they were they felt that it was important for them to have some windows on that side, um, being the south side, but they wanted them up high to so as to have privacy um, in the bedroom. So we ended up matching the fascia height on the existing structure and the new structure as such. Um, aside from that, and I'm open to any questions, but aside from that, the finishes are all the same as what was previously proposed. The color matches the building as previously proposed. Um, it's an asphalt shingle roof as previously proposed. And the windows are four over one uh, Marvin Elevate, which was what was previously proposed. They were called Marvin Integrity back then, but they're the same window, just a different rebranding of that. I also have, if you're interested in it, there is a, um, there is a, I'll just find out how to do this. There's also a survey of the property which shows um, the proposed structure, which is a dash line. Um, we're well outside of the setbacks. I think it's 10 feet side and back in that zone and we're 38 and a half feet on the back and 25 feet on the side away from the side setback. This was a survey from a couple months ago. So Kyle, what is the most significant change? And, and I, it, the requirement is if yep. it changes come back here, what is the most significant change? Uh, most significant change is the location as it's moved more south compared to what was proposed 
previously. Um, it's still being used the same way. I'd say also um, the wall height before the wall height was shown lower to stay below the the eave, and now it's um, it's the eaves are matching the faces match each other. So that's the most significant. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Kyle, you had mentioned that the footprint of the addition that was built previously that, you know, approved in 2017 uh, yep. grew slightly, correct? And and the addition that you're here to discuss today shrunk to sort of accommodate. So um, to, to recap, you had mentioned that the overall square footage of the project with this proposal is one square foot less than what was previously approved. That's correct? Yeah, yeah, correct. Well, maybe... We're not saying the same thing, but I'll make sure that we're clear. Um, the footprint of the structure that was built in 2019, as well as the addition, was approved at 2,220 square feet. Mm -hmm. um, now the overall footprint is 2,219. Um, the addition in question was previously proposed at 18 by 21, yeah. and now it's 18 by 25 and a half or 25 foot six. But the main structure built in 2019 was reduced by that same square footage or actually one more square foot than that was reduced. Right. Yeah. No, we're, we're saying the same thing. I'm just, um, I just yeah. want to make sure like the floor area ratio basically, you know, is, is equivalent to what was, um, previously, um, you know, deemed allowable. So I, you know, um, from, from my perspective, given the setbacks, um, you know, and that you're, you're meeting and exceeding that, you know, and, and the FAR is still matched. Um, you know, I, I think that that solves any questions, you know, that I would have or any issues that I would have from a citing standpoint. Okay, great. I have a question, Mr. Chairman, if that's okay. Um, so do you have, um, like, I know you have a summary of the changes proposed. Do, does, do those changes also include your calculations for lot and building coverage? Or do you not have those handy? We do. We do have those. Um, the requirements are summarized on here, uh, just as a reference. Yep. So you can see they're kind of centered now. The actual coverage um, proposed building coverage is 18.5% percent with allowable 25% and overall lot coverage um, is 36.1% with allowable 40. Thank you. You're welcome. And that includes all hardscaping and structures and driveway. Do any other board members have any questions? I, I don't, my, all of my questions have been answered, so. Okay. Rob, does this require a vote? Yes, so uh, basically the board has to do a simple majority vote. So that means uh, three out of the four of you have to vote yes to approve it. Um, and that's all you really have to do. Uh, once you, if you decide to approve it as a board, um, you know, you do your motion, your second, like usual, um, these guys can go ahead and move forward with their, with their building permit, so. Do I hear a motion from any of the board members? So moved. Second. Back in. Okay. Or not. <laughs> okay. Mr. Gilbert, move the, the uh, question and Mr. Slovatar seconded. Uh, I'll take a roll for approval of the, the, uh, the request for a special permit. Uh, the chair votes aye. Mr. Gilbert? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Slovatar? Aye. So the, the special permit is granted. Uh, just to clarify, Mr. Chairman, you're not granting them a special permit. You're just approving their, uh, their modification to their plans. OK. So just to clarify, um, so the board just voted to approve that their plans um, as presented, the modified plans are acceptable to you. Ah, thank you. Mm -hmm.
All right. All right. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next on the agenda for tonight, uh, for a public hearing, we have ZBA FY 2023-18, ASD Shootsbury Mass Solar LLC. A request for a special permit under section 3.340 of the zoning bylaw to construct a 9.35 megawatt DC, 4.4 megawatt AC ground mounted solar photovoltaic array spanning 41 acres on a uh, 102 acre site with accompanying battery energy storage system at three parcels of land owned by WD Coles Inc. Identified as map 9B, parcels 11 and 12, and map 9D, parcel 27 on Shootsbury Road. Uh, outlying residents, RO, zoning district, frontage and access to the subject parcels of land is located between 187 and 201 Shootsbury Road. Uh, tonight we'll have a, a discussion by the uh, petitioners. Uh, we will have general comment. There is no anticipation of being able to get this concluded this evening, and we will set a date certain to follow up on this. Um, with the public hearing, I'm going to read off a very long list of transmittals that we have. Um, the, the ZBA will open the public hearing, allow for application to present their pro project to the board, give comments and questions to the applicant on their presentation, take public comment and continue the board hearing at a, to a future date certain. The public meeting portion of this project will remain closed. The board members will not deliberate on the merits of the proposal. The following submissions have been received by town staff. Application materials, ZBA FY 2023-18 application form, the management plan, specific findings response, landowner authorization letter dated April 27, 2023, project narrative dated August, 2022, battery energy storage system, Narrative, evidence of insurance dated April 27th, 2023, interconnected service agreement with Eversource, soil and wetlands and stormwater reports, soil infiltration report dated March 3rd, 2022, order of resource area delineation expired on August 10th, 2023, Wetland Delineation Survey dated July 15th, 2020. Natural Resources Inventory dated August 29th, 2022. Water Quality Memo dated April 19th, 2023. Stormwater Management Report dated August 20, August 2022. Stormwater Pollution Prevention Plan, Prevention Plan dated August 20th, August 2022, Record Conditions Plan dated March 2nd, 2023. Emergency Procedures and Maintenance, Operation and Maintenance Plan, Energy Storage System Risk Mitigation Strategy dated May 2023. Material Safety Data Sheet, Specification Sheets, One Line Diagram dated November 16th, 2022. Module Specification Sheets, battery storage specification sheet, inverter specification sheet, converter specification sheet, solar panel racking details. Sound analysis, sound map, sound study dated November 14th, 2022. Decommissioning documents, draft decommissioning document, not the final version. Sound study dated November 14th, 2022. Decommissioning documents, draft decommissioning document, not the final version. 
decommissioning plan dated April 2023. Mass Historic Commission submission. Mass Historic Commission project notification form submitted April 22nd, 2021. Mass Historic Commission response letter to project notification form dated May 10th, 2021. Mass Historic Commission response letter to site plans dated June 11th, 2021. Mass Historic Commission response letter to archeological report dated August 18th, 2022. Mass um, and plans and relevant documents. ZBA FY 2023-18 plan set dated August 2022, revised April 19th, 2023 and May 26th, 2023, prepared by Verdentera. Plan revision summary, environmental buffer statement, construction phasing narrative, Blair study dated July 2023, 2022, excuse me. Line of sight diagram dated April 2023. Lot coverage cal calculations. Proposed signage example. Transmittal from town departments. Wetlands administrator submitted August 15th, 2023. Memo from Chris Brestrip. Planning director submitted a August 18th, 2023. Fire department submitted August 21st, 2023. Public comments. Phil Rich received August 8th, 2023. Robert Bisucha and Jenny Kalick received August 11th, 2023. That's the list of documents that we have. Um, obviously there are some things that are not ready yet. So, that will that that coincides with what this will the meeting uh, will be when we adjourn, adjourn tonight. It will be set to a, a date certain in the future to to continue this. Uh, are there any? Uh, can we have the presentation by the applicant and whom is there to present? And could you please state your name and address for the record, please? All right. So I'm promoting a uh, list of people to panelists so they can uh, present. All right. And of course, applicants, if there's anybody else you want me to promote to a panelist that you wish to have present as well, just let me know. Attorney Reedy, I assume as usual, you're first to go. You've got it, Mr. Chair. Please do. Let me see if I think uh, Andrew Chabot, I don't know, Rob, if you brought him in as a panelist, but he should be here. Okay, great. Uh, he um, did my invitation to be a panelist. So he's he's still an attendee in the audience. Okay. Yep. Oh, there you go. He is accepting my invitation and should be joining us. Perfect. All right. Um, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, for the record, Tom Reedy, an attorney with Bacon Wilson out of Amherst here on behalf of ASD Shootsbury MA Solar LLC, who will refer to as Pure Sky from now on because the other one's a mouthful. Um, here, uh, seeking a special permit for an energy facility, Mr. Chairman, as you noted, off of Shootsbury Road on land owned by WD Coles. Uh, with me this evening, we've got a, a slew of folks. Um, we've got from Pierre Sky, Andrew Chabot and Corey McCandless. Um, we expect to have Lawrence Cook probably at the next meeting and, and chair to your point. You know, we don't expect this to be uh, a one and done. We're we're here for the process. As, as you'll hear from Andrew, we've been in this process for quite some time. Um, and, and we're happy to get into all the details when it's appropriate. And I think tonight, you know, you'll hear a, a higher overview of the project. And then we're here to listen. You know, we've heard a lot already from from abutters, um, but we've done a lot of design. So I think you know we hope you're going to be very pleased with what we've what we're presenting. Uh, also this evening from Bird and Terra, who was the site designer, Chris Connolly, 
uh, and he's here. And I think between Andrew and Corey and Chris, they're going to do the majority of the presentation, sharing of the screen and the overview. We're going to try to keep it somewhat brief, 10 minutes or so. Uh, there is a lot of material. We fully expect this to likely to have a peer review. Uh, as you noted, um, you know, the, the order of resource area delineation, which delineated the edges of the, the resource area, expired in August, but frankly, not a big deal. One of the conditions of that ORAD was that we refresh the wetland delineation, and we've already started that process. Um, and so we would, you know, when it does get continued, we think it'll take a month and a half or so. So, you know, we're looking at an October meeting, hopefully, when you continue it to that time date certain um, we expect to have a good handle on, you know, we expect to have a good handle on the delineation, you know, by tomorrow, if not the first of next week. So, you know, we've been working on it. Um, and so I think, you know, for, for tonight, so I don't steal any more thunder, let me turn it over to Andrew and Corey and Chris to walk through by all means, stop us. If you've got questions, if you want to wait for the end to, for questions, we're going to be taking plenty of notes. So, you know, this won't be the last time we see you. For sure. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over. Great. Thanks very much, Tom. And uh, as Tom mentioned, my name is Andrew Chabot with Pure Sky Energy. Um, I apologize if I'm a little raspy. I'm just on the tail end of a cold here. So sorry for your, your ears having to listen to me. Uh, if I have to cough, I'll just go on mute for a sec. But I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, and uh, it's just, as Tom mentioned, a fairly brief presentation, really just designed to provide an overview of the project, some specific uh, items. But really, the last thing uh, we want is for me to just be talking at you. Uh, I'd really love to hear your questions uh, so we can try to provide answers and uh, get you those responses. So um, I'm just gonna dive in. So here is uh, our, uh, you know, as Tom mentioned, we're, we're Pure Sky Energy, formerly AMP Energy. Um, we are a company that focuses on developing renewable energy projects. Uh, in our the core areas that we're, we're located in, that is um, you know, Massachusetts, New York, Illinois, Minnesota. Um, we look to partner with towns wherever possible for offtake, you know, if they can provide the energy to them, to individuals, housing authorities, uh, sometimes businesses as well. Uh, we're actually actively already in uh, working in Amherst with the Hickory Ridge project. Um, and uh, constructing that solar facility and we've been working on that for quite some time. Uh, Lawrence Cook, is, as Tom mentioned, is our construction manager on that. Fortunately, he's on a flight tonight, uh, but hopefully he can uh, be able to provide some input um, at a future time. Um, to, to go through this, I'll go through this pretty quickly, you know, 10 minutes as I said, but, you know, we're strongly supported by uh, WD Coles, the landowner for the project. Uh, they have set aside certain properties to pursue renewable energy projects in addition to setting aside over 5,500 acres of uh, working forces, uh, you know, to turn that off to development for the, in perpetuity. Um, and this is part of their overall vision to uh, be environmental stewards. And we're here to support them doing that. And um, this Shrewsbury Road project that we're gonna speak to tonight is one of those such projects. Um, as Tom also alluded to, you know, we have been working on this project for quite some time. Uh, back in August of 2020 is when we originally got the, the ORAD that was mentioned. Uh, and from there into 2021, we met with various town individuals and authorities. I'm not going to go through every one of these. Um, we hosted a few Zoom uh, meetings with Butters, a site walk with the Butters, uh, and the Director of Conservation Development, along with WD Coles, to show the property, answer any feedback and questions that came up. Uh, we then went to the Conservation Commission of CONCOM to speak to the project. At that time, we were looking to um, do a little bit of clearing in the wetland buffer zone for shade purposes so it wouldn't shade the panels. Um, upon you know, working with the CONCOM and getting their feedback, we then revised the design and redu reduced the project size by about 10% from the original proposal. Um, part of that also, that uh, progress with the CONCOM was uh, there was additional work that they wanted to see. Um, that was a soil infiltration report um, that would have unfortunately taken too much time for us to complete while still staying within uh, the allowable time that we had with the CONCOM. So we withdrew that application to do that work. Um, we did pursue that work, did additional site walks with uh, CONCOM administrator uh, to look at any additional potential 
isolated wetlands on the site, um, had a pre-application meeting with the town, uh, and pursued other other uh, studies such as a water quality study, uh, then submitted our ZBA application in August of last year. And in working with the planning department over this, uh, since then, we uh, pursued other work that would make this a more robust application, such as listed here, such as uh, slope analysis, and, uh, a glare study as two examples. Um, in June, that's uh, our application was deemed complete and brings us here here today. Um, I'm gonna you know, go through this very, very briefly, but the reason why we're pursuing real energy projects is uh, many people might not be aware that over half of the energy we get from the electric grid in New England is from fossil fuels, it's natural gas. Um, and in Massachusetts alone, it's close to 80%. Um, the state has a goal of trying to reach 40% renewable energy by the year 2030. Currently, we're at 12%. So um, our mission is to try to help the state meet those goals by pursuing renewable, renewable energy projects to help get us there. Um, and this project would uh, be able to provide uh, clean energy onto the grid to help us uh, move towards, towards that, uh, that end goal. Um, the environmental benefits that a project like this would be able to provide is kind of a snapshot listed here. Um, the energy equivalent, it would be powering about 1,500 Massachusetts homes, uh, the equivalent of about taking 900 cars off the road. And um, using EPA calculators compared to the sequestration potential for this system over the expected lifetime of 35 to 40 years, it's about um, the equivalent of... Uh, over 5,000 acres of forest sequestering carbon. When you consider the um, fossil fuel emissions that aren't going into the atmosphere from natural gas power plants. Um, I think that's an important point just to, to make. Uh, what we're seeking to do under the array is also establish a pollinator meadow of native, native vegetation. This is something that's also promoted by the UMass Amherst Clean Energy Extension uh, through their PV certification uh, pollinator program. Um, this is uh, kind of a win-win for everybody. It provides additional grassland habitat for certain uh, species that direly you know, need that, such as uh, bees, grassland birds. Uh, it's more cost-effective for us because uh, we result in less mowing um, and frankly just looks a whole lot better. Um, what we hope this project will be able to provide uh, in terms of more direct benefits though, to the town would be, uh, if it were uh, approved and, and granted you know, ability to move forward, would be you know, long-term tax revenue to the town over 35 to 40 years it would, be, it would be in existence. Providing that clean energy opportunity, uh, well, export onto the local grid, um, in addition to creating, you know, the additional habitat that is, uh, is sorely needed in, in Massachusetts. Uh, we've also moved forward with, um, you know, doing some initial collaboration with local researchers who want to study the long-term effects of solar in certain habitats and in particular uh, soil carbon. Um, that's something we've already provided a letter, letter of support for them for their uh, for their submission. So we hope that that is granted that we can move forward with providing more data and more research for the future to make systems even better. Uh, and uh, you know we're happy to talk more about the project. That's kind of a brief overview. I'm going to turn it over to Corey now to for a few minutes for us to go through the overview of the project itself some of what you've already received in the materials, and then we can turn to any specific details from there. So, um, Corey, I'll just uh, continue navigating here. You can just let me know if you want me to go to the next slide. Yeah, thank you so much, Andrew. Can everybody hear me okay? Thumbs up if you can. I was having some technical issues earlier. I hear you. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you again so much for having us tonight. We're really excited to be here. Um, we've got a great project and we're excited to work with you guys uh, moving forward on this. So what is Shrewsbury Road Solar Project? So it is a, um, it's located on Shrewsbury Road in the jurisdiction of Amherst, Massachusetts. Um, it is a pretty large site at over, you know, 102 acres um, we are proposing a project footprint of 40, a little over 41 acres. A lot of that will require tree clearing. Um, we are staying outside of, you know, the wetland, wetland resource areas as well as the buffers. We do understand that our ORAD has expired, um, but we are taking steps to read, you know, to take another look at those wetlands. And um, so far, we haven't seen any changes to what we previously had delineated. So I'm not saying that um, nothing about this will change, but I will say that 
um, you know, this site plan is is very, it's a, it's a great site plan. We've worked very hard and very long on it. Um, and we have to take a lot of things into consideration when we are citing these projects. Um, and so, yeah, so that was, you know, our note about the site design. We also wanted to avoid steep slopes. So we are avoiding those as well. And um, yeah, it's, you know, 4.4 megawatt uh, AC system. And, uh, you know, per Massachusetts law, we do need to include um, battery and energy storage, which we do have on this equipment pad. Um, so, Andrew, I don't know if you can zoom in, um, but you will yeah, I see. Think, yeah, Corey, maybe we can focus on the, the site plan at the end of the presentation. We'll let Chris um, zoom in on that. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So let's hop to the next slide. So um, this project is located, you know, off of Shrewsbury Road, and it is set back quite a distance. There are some abutters um, that will, you know, that will be, um, that, you know, that are located in, you know, fairly close proximity to the project. However, there's ample screening. Um, some of it will be planted by us. Others is pre-existing natural vegetative screening. Um, so, yeah, just looking at some of these numbers, the distance from the nearest abutter property line to the array limit of disturbance, we define the limit of disturbance as where the fence line is. Um, so the closest one is the, is a little over 200 feet. Uh, the distance from the nearest abutter, um, their home to the array uh, fence line is, you know, 245 feet. Next, the distance from the nearest abutter property line to the array modules, so the actual solar modules themselves, that is uh, 274 feet away. And then um, from the abutter's property line to the equipment pad is over 800 feet. So it is set back quite a distance. And um, this is a detail of the screening that we have proposed um, that runs parallel with Shootsbury Road, as you can see on the right hand side, those green structures are the abutters homes and um, north of there is Shootsbury Road. And then you can see our access road snaking down along um, where the road kind of juts north. Ours is cutting out and does continue down um, towards the south and southeastern section of the property. So. So that's roughly where it is located. Um, this, you know, we are proposing a Powen manufactured um, battery and energy storage system of uh, 750E uh, stack centipede. Uh, we also have, an, and I apologize, my audio wasn't working earlier. So Tom, I'm not sure if you mentioned that we do have two representatives from Powen on the phone call with us tonight. Um, I'm not sure if, if they, if Rob, if we can make them panelists so they can speak and just introduce themselves. Um, but they're really here tonight to, you know, answer any basic questions about equipment and also um, explain how this particular technology works. Yeah. Uh, do you have their names um, just so I can look for them? Yeah, so we have, uh, let's see, Martin Bykowski and then Josh, uh, Joshua Preeb. And, uh Perhaps we can do that in the Q&A uh, section to make sure we get through the presentation first. Sure, yeah. yeah. Um, while we're doing, can you hop to the next slide, Andrew, while Rob gets them to be panelists' uh, permissions? So we do have um, a phasing plan that we have also um, incorporated into the site application package. Um, it is broken down into two phases, phase A and phase B. There are five um, subsections of each phase. And so phase A, that'll be, you know, roughly 10 to 30 days. Um, it is, it, it's a pretty large time window because um, each phase is a little different, but they don't exceed more than 10 acres for, you know, for each particular phase. Um, on the left of this of the slide here, you will see those um, phases color coded. Purple is phase one, phase two will be the light blue on top, phase three will be the yellow, um, the centerpiece there, phase four is the green on the right, 
and then phase five is um, near, you know, is the end, and that's near the bottom. So it's basic, um, you know, construction phasing work. We will be clearing, we will be grubbing, we will be grading, um, you know, we will be making um, temporary access roads to get to those different um, parts of the parcel during each different phase. Um, swales and basins laydown areas will also be incorporated um, for, you know, erosion and sediment control and also for stormwater, we'll have level spreaders and soil stabilization. Um, so that's, that's the bulk of phase A. Uh, phase B is 10 to 20 days. So that's where we're actually putting the equipment into the ground. Um, so we'll be installing racking modules, conduit, the wiring, the equipment pad will also be installed. Um, overhead poles to connect to our point, um, our point of interconnection along Shrewsbury Road will also be installed, and um, soil stabilization to help, um, you know, make sure that soil, you know, that ground stays there and it doesn't get washed away in the event of any sort of um, heavy rainstorm. So, we do have the phasing plan narrative that we have submitted. Um, and Chris from Vernon Terra is also on the line and perhaps after this presentation, we can open it up to him to break this down in a little bit more further detail than, than I did. <laughs> you wanna jump, <clears throat> jump to the next slide, Andrew, please. Great, and I can jump in for construction. And, and this is a high level overview uh, Gantt chart provided by Lawrence Cook, our construction manager on, you know, theoretically what we could expect from construction for a project such as this. Um, it operates, on, and obviously this this is, you know, malleable and flexible, but it operates under the assumption that approval is is granted at the end of this year and then kind of stacked beyond that. But that is, uh, it breaks down into effectively about uh, an 18 months from start to finish, uh, I guess, pre-construction to flipping the switch on, powering up the system and exporting clean energy to the grid uh, process. Um, it's act effectively uh, the actual construction itself that where Corey mentioned about, you know, um, you know, clearing some of the land and actually putting the equipment into the ground uh, will be about seven to eight months expected. Um, that is uh, part of the phasing plan that Corey, Corey also mentioned in terms of that, that uh, that process, and then as equipment is putting into the ground, you can pursue you know certain activities on part of the site, or other uh, other activities on other parts of the site. And what I mean by that is, you, know, you might put in the piling into the ground in one section, move on to the next section, do piling over in that section while you're putting modules on the first section. So it's a little bit overlapped there, but that gets us into uh, you know uh, moving forward with the project in, in a timely manner. Uh, throughout the process of construction, we'll do regular regular litter removal. Uh, any storm events of quarter inch or more in a 24-hour period would have the access road inspected to make sure that it's clear and safe uh, and certain stormwater features and protections put in, in place as well uh, for, for the projects. Um, Long-term O&M, uh, I don't know where you can jump in here as well, but it's, it's fairly simple. This is a very inert, passive site. There's... Uh, there's really not a, a whole lot of activity that happens on a, on a project site such as this. Um, usually it's, uh, you know, once, twice a year uh, or after storm events going to just look at the site to make sure that you no know, equipment is damaged, make sure there's no litter or stormwater features have been, have been damaged to make sure that uh, if there has been anything that happened in that nature, it's repaired and fixed as quickly as possible. Um, very, very uh, simple process. It's usually just one or two people going out there in a pickup truck, just looking at the site and making some spot checks and uh, from there. Um, I think with that, it's probably enough of us talking at you. Uh, for the question section, I'd love to stop there and uh, circle back to anything we touched on whatsoever to expand on. Um, and we can, as Corey mentioned, we can turn it over to some select members of our expanded team here uh, to address uh, things that are maybe a little technical. And, uh, but um, let me let me stop there. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I I I will begin with a few questions that I have, and then the rest of the uh, board members will, uh, I'm sure, have a number of other questions. Um, I 
a remark. I know it is a probability that we're going to need some additional uh, help on this. Um, I think that we're probably going to want to have a solar PV and best specialist um, as a consultant for us and also someone uh, as an environmental or groundwater consultant for us. Um, Rob, you'll note that. Uh, an another factor that I'm a little concerned with is uh, you may have noticed the roads in Amherst are not always in the best condition. Uh, I'd like to have the someone from the Department of Public Works comment to us, come in and comment at the next meeting uh, after they've taken a look at the roads and see what the, I know the traffic once the construction is finished will be negligible, but uh, during the construction, there may be some need uh, to look at our roads prior to it and see what might need to be done, if anything. Um, I uh, uh, Another comment, which I'm sure Attorney Reedy may have mentioned to you, I, I'm aware, uh, we're aware of the requirement for pollinators and you are doing a good job on the, on the area covered. However, you've got arborvitae indicated as your barrier and they are not pollinators. So I think you're gonna to need to take another look at um, the pollinators and, and wonder what you might've considered other than the arborvitae. Um, Mr. Meadows, can I ask a quick question about that? Sure. Um, so when, are you mentioning the arborvitae as part of the vegetative screening proposed in parallel to Shrewsbury Road or just in? The vegetative way? screening, correct. That is indicated oh. that you're going to be planting them? Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yes. Or you just consider holly as because of its pollinator qualities. I took the words out of your mouth, Mr. You Trish. certainly did. Uh, <laughs> I'm writing it down. I'm writing it down. Uh, and lastly, the fire department has made some comments uh, regarding um, your choice of the best system. And um, I think that there should be some time to address that and also discuss it directly with the fire department. Perfect. Yes. Those are those are my comments so far. Um, any of the other board members want to? Mr. Slobotar. I I just uh, one quick clarification of something you said. I think it was on the last slide. The last slide during operation and maintenance, you mentioned that inspections of the site will take place with uh, a truck with two people driving onto the property and looking around. Are those inspections, uh, will they be made as part of an automatic, uh, part of a rigid schedule or will they be as needed or discretionary? That's a good question. Um, at, at minimum, there would be a set schedule every year where they go out there to observe the site and then in certain events like a storm event for example um there would be a, a special case where they would go out um to review as well so it would be kind of a, a dual approach um but when they go out there what you storm event i certainly understand but you just a moment ago said annual are you are you is does that imply that the truck with the two people in it will go out once a year at, at minimum, just to uh, do simple O&M checks of the facility. As you mentioned, yeah, if there was a, an event that causes concern to go out to just look at the site earlier, they would want to make sure that everything, the stormwater features was, was okay. Right. But, but, um, yeah. but if, there's no, if there's no identifiable event, like a severe windstorm, or I don't really care, a severe weather event, if there is none of no significant event in a four month period, mm -hmm. does that mean that at no point during that four month period, any representative of the company that's operating this would would be there? That it could be four or six months and no one would set foot on the site. Uh, that that is feasible. Yes, um, okay. I will say that 
one of the one of the aspects of this site that uh, well, facilities like this is they uh, heavily implement uh, remote monitoring capabilities so that there is a way to monitor the site remotely for just generally day to day. Um, but uh, because these facilities are so passive in nature, uh, they, they really kind of run generally like clockwork and there's not a need for someone to be out there usually. Right, is, is the monitoring um, visual with cameras or is it sensors? It can be, typically sensors. Uh, in some in some situations, there can be cameras that are added for security or safety. Okay, so if something would develop that's unforeseen, such as deer getting hung up in mm. the fencing or something like that, is it possible that a an unforeseen condition would develop, and it could be months before you discovered that there is a migratory route or that that there are deer getting hung up in the fences and there are six of them by the time someone shows up? Or would your monitors detect that kind of thing? I'm not thinking of it becoming a popular place to dump bodies by the mob, <laughs> but I'm I'm just, it, it it just strikes me. It's it's uh, just a comment. I'm new to this kind of development, other than having driven by them. But uh, anything that is just not not observed by human eyes, connected to a human brain, for six months, all sorts of things can happen. And it it would seem that if you have other operations in the area or you have representatives who are in the area it's not a necessarily a, a a terrible burden for somebody to drive by on a more frequent regular schedule and go in and confirm that absolutely nothing's happening you could probably do that in 10 minutes uh it's it's a very good thought and um while for pure, I guess when I think O&M, I think, you know, equipment, but for the actual site, um, our, our landowner partner, W.E. Coles is based in Amherst and, uh, our, uh, our partner there, uh, the, the head of uh, their forestry team, um, is active in the field all the time. I don't think I want to, uh, commit him to going out every, you know, week to look at the site, but I think that he certainly would be on the site, uh, in the general area. Um, and if there was a concern could pop in that said, um, you know, there is an equipment on, uh, a camera on the equipment pad. Uh, but to my knowledge, I'm not, I'm not personally familiar with, uh, uh, situations like that where, where deer try to jump over and then are not able to, and, um, get stuck on the, on the fence. Usually the fences, um, and I think Chris can correct me on this, I'm off, but the, the fence top has a, a metal bar instead of. Uh, prongs and so uh, they would just sort of if they tried jumping on they would kind of right. roll off and and the fence is quite tall i i actually read that part of the description and i think it was eight feet or seven seven or eight feet seven. yes seven feet and it specifically said there's no barbed wire or pointed anything on the top and there's a 12 inch space at the bottom to let small wildlife get through correct so you know, clearly there's attention being paid to that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Rob? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I do have a question regarding, um, I know it's a, you're growing a natural pollinator meadow, but I had questions regarding your landscaping and snow removal schedules. Um, so uh, you did submit materials in your management, well, not materials, but you did submit, mention your management plan that um, you were gonna do those two features as needed. Um, do you have like a, a set schedule for when you anticipate having folks come by to trim or to do any sort of snow removal? And if so, do you have any local contractors in mind? And if so, do you have name and contact info? And uh, would you be able to provide that information maybe at the next at the next public hearing? So that's a good question. I can uh, I can take those. Um, so uh, we we would anticipate for the pollinator meadow itself. Uh, because the kind of the intent of that 
of that feature is to just let it sort of do its thing. Mm -hmm. um, we we would really only need and want to get out there to do any trimming um, if uh, the situation arose where any of that vegetation was starting to shade any of the panels in a significant significant proportion. Uh, because of the seed mix we select, it's usually uh, vegetation that doesn't grow as high to do that. But with invasive species, which is possible, um, that is something we would then go and spot, you know, spot remove those um, and then maintain it. So typically that's only once a year, um, but, and, uh, and that would be um, most likely in outside of nesting periods. So it's probably, you know, like before April, um, would be, we would get out there to kind of do some of that work um, just to not interfere with any sort of nesting habitat for, for birds or other wildlife, but also to balance the, uh, the uh, kind of any overwintering qualities that that vegetation might have. Um, and then to your second question, uh, we, at this stage, we haven't selected any vendors to do that yet. Uh, we typically uh, want to get a little further in the process before um, seeking to uh, lock anybody down just to make sure that we're, you know, not wasting their time if it's, a, and make sure it's a real project. Uh, but I think our intent would be, and uh, I'll, I won't speak for Loris, but I, I think that uh, our intent would be to use anybody local as to whatever whatever uh, extent we can. It's kind of our, our bread and butter. Thank you. Are there, are there any other board members with questions? Uh, I have one more then. Um, your your interconnect is going to be on Shutesbury Road, you said, and you're yes. putting pole, poles up along your entry road to get to, to the interconnect. Do you know if uh, National Grid is planning on increasing the capacity of the wires going to the substation in order to accommodate this? That's a very good question. Uh, so to, yes, there, to a certain extent, they will be needing to upgrade some of the utility lines to go from single phase mm -hmm. to three phase. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, let me just, I'm gonna go to an Im image of the site so I can just sort of point out a few things. Uh, if this, there we go, let's go up. Uh, there's one a little earlier that might be a little better. Okay, so for this this kind of high level view of the site, um, just so uh, to, to be clear and kind of what the utility is requiring is they will have uh, seven utility poles going in along, along this road, going into the site. And then there's a uh, uh, kind of a trade-off where then we would have three poles of our own with the equipment that we would require at that, at that point until about, if you can see my mouse where I'm hovering, where, where this uh, first basin is, mm -hmm. then the wires would go underground along the road all the way to the equipment pad um, to try to min minimize further uh, visual impact. Um, but to focus on the other part of your question, yeah, uh, the, the way uh, the electric grid was originally built out, um, it really wasn't designed for distributed energy generation facilities like this to be you know, placed in, in various places. It was more designed for coal plants, nuclear plants, central facilities. So um, much of the existing grid is single phase. And so one of the aspects of uh, what our work entails is when we do propose a facility like this, more often than not, we, we do have to upgrade those wires to be able to hold, uh, take the greater capacity of electricity that will be flowing to that substation. Um, I think it's the Amherst 17K substation that's uh, um, down the road. Um, so uh, that that would be required. And, and net, uh, the utility is the one that sort of just tells us what needs to happen. And we don't really have a lot of say in the manner. Um, they, uh, they just sort of say, this is what we need to do. And here's how much you better pay us. Otherwise, you're not doing anything. And so um, that's kind of the situation we're in now with them. So is that going to the substation that's down on Route 116? Or is there another another substation you're going to? No, I, I believe that is the one. Uh, I believe that is the one. And are, are there upgrades necessary for that substation in order to accommodate your your site? Or there are. So uh, typically, a substation like that, um, it only, as you can imagine, only has so much capacity can take and distribute any any mm -hmm. uh, moment in time. So we have to usually up, up the transformer and maybe some other equipment on that substation and that's wrapped in so it's usually a few different chunks it's sort of the substation upgrades itself 
the line upgrades, and then labor, and you know that we need to pay for those three items. So uh, it, it involves all three of those for this project. So will you have transformers on your site also, or your or on Shutesbury Road, or are they not until you get to the substation? Uh, really, not until you get to the substation for the the ones we're talking about on our on our facility on the equipment pad. Um, we do have uh, well plans for the energy storage system that's required to the state center program, um, the inverter, um, and then uh, some other power electronics there that then will go into the poles and then go into the into the uh, the grid. But you usually the the energy that's being generated by the facility is a, is adequate for the three phase lines to carry that to the substation. Then the substation will typically step that up um, if it's going further or sometimes you know, step it down for distributed use. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions from board or oh, Rob? Yes. Um, so Mr. Chairman, if it's okay, um, I just wanna state that um, any questions that do come up from the board that the applicant was able to answer tonight Obviously, I'm going to make a list of those and email that to the applicant after this meeting. But if it's okay with you, Mr. Chairman, there's also some documents that I was hoping to address that need to be updated um, prior to the next public hearing. Of course, I'll send that an email form as well to the applicant. But is it okay if I briefly go over those documents right please now? Do. Okay. Yes, please. So there is a good deal of documents that were submitted that still have AMP on them. Um, I don't have the exact full list right now, but some of those documents include the uh, operations and maintenance plan, as well as the um, emergency response. I believe it was the risk mitigation strategy plan. Um, so just before the next meeting, you know, if you could change that to the current company, Pure Sky, um, that would be uh, favorable. Um, and then I noticed in the operation and maintenance plan, um, you don't really address any sort of section in regards to site security. So um, I don't know if you guys want to give us like some sort of uh, description. Uh, you can answer that question after I'm done as well, if you want to, like what, what security measures you have on site. We know the fence is up to seven, seven and a half feet tall, but um, you, you had mentioned there's one camera on the equipment pad, um, but you know we don't really know, know much more besides that. Um, and also uh, the emergency, sorry, the, I believe you call it the risk mitigation strategy document. Um, so you do a pretty good job of talking about like what hazards exist on the battery storage units and uh, what could happen. And I also believe you include a document that talks about what to do if you're exposed to any of those and like what the symptoms are, what the remediations are. But I would recommend including a section where you describe how a specific incident were to occur, such as a fire or if there was a leak. Um, maybe instead of being vague, like you were in that document, make it specific to those examples on how the fire department could respond to them. Um, and if that technology were to ever change, you know, the board should consider conditioning that, um, that plan should be continuously updated. So the fire department could respond to those future threats if they were to occur. Um, so those are things to keep in mind. Uh, those are kind of the big ones that I notice. And of course, one more thing to consider um, on your site plans, it would be wise to include setback distances from the nearest building structures that include solar panels to abutting property lines. So just so we have an idea of how close you are to the setback of the front side and, and rear yard setbacks. I know the front is that small sliver that's on Shrewsbury Road and you're really far away from that, but I notice uh, on the side yard and the rear, um, you're kind of close and we don't know exactly what that distance is. So if you could just have like a, maybe an a additional page in your plans that show those distances, that'll be most helpful. And again, I will provide all of this to you, the applicants and email form, so you guys can have a full list of what we're looking for. Um, but yeah, I, I noticed I brought up the, the issue of site security. I don't know if you guys have any security measures in place that you're trying or that you would propose for this, Andrew, um, if you wanted to speak to that. Sure. No, and that that's, oh, Corey, did you want to? Were you going to say Knox Box because that's what I was going to talk about? <laughs> uh, why, don't, why don't you start and I'll, I'll jump in after. Okay, great. Um, yeah, Rob, we can definitely put in a Knox Box. Um, it gives access to, you know, it gives access to the fire department, the police department if they needed to have it. 
um, you know, if, if the board wanted the code to that as well, um, you know, the landowner would also have the code to it so that they can have access to the site. Um, we can figure out what that site access list should be. Otherwise, Knoxbox seems to be a really well um, solution for this. And it's, you know, it's pretty standard and acceptable across the Commonwealth and different municipalities. So I, is that is that what you were looking for? Were you looking for something a little bit more robust or? So I guess, um, well, the Knox boxes, uh, the fire department's most likely going to require that anyways. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I'm talking more about, you know, um, do you have any sort of camera system that you're going to have on your perimeter fencing? Are you going to have any sort of sensor, uh, anything to, if somebody was lucky enough to scale that fence, if, if they were inclined to do so, how would you know about it? I mean, is it something that you would not know because you don't have any measures in place? I'm just asking out of curiosity. Yeah, no, it's it's a fair question. Um, so I, I guess the the short and, and honest answer is, you know, if anybody walks up to this facility, I mean, with the wire cutters, bolt cutters, they're it's hard for us to to prevent that person who's determined with that to access that. That facility. I mean, we we can implement certain features such as other cameras, um, but uh, due to sort of the remote sort of out of sight, out of mind feature of, of a lot of that, the facility itself, uh, we do have the twenty four seven monitoring of, of the critical equipment. Um, but uh, typically, it's it's not uh, it's not something that we will regularly monitor the perimeter, as an example, um, just because it's uh, it can be. Um, uh, really just, I don't know. It's, it's just, uh, not, not necessarily, you know, you're not going to see a lot, I guess I'll say on a day to day, but unfortunately there are people out there that would, that would try to access a facility like this. And the best we, we can do is try to just, uh, post signage saying this is private property. Also, it's very dangerous to go inside because there's trick, you know, wires everywhere that are high voltage, um, and so we, we would try to do our best to discourage that and then react accordingly if it became a problem. They, they would, yeah, I mean, they would have to try really hard to, to hurt themselves though. I mean, there are wires, but they are managed. They are tucked away. Uh, none of them are exposed. Right. Um, and, you know, they're, they're all cased in rubber and, you know, fire, fire safety code um, housing. So w normally we don't have any sort of cameras up around our other sites. We just haven't seen the need for it. Um, if that is something that the board would require or ask of us, we can entertain that. But from our point of view, we're not really that concerned about safety. It's, it's private property. It's posted. Um, it's set far back. It's set back quite a ways. And um, it's, you know, there is a fence and a, a gate that's locked. Um, I think, Rob, oh yeah, please go ahead. Uh, I was simply going to say that that I think that Rob's. We just had a uh, a best system come up in front of us uh, a little while ago, and it was very much enclosed, uh, and had uh, a considerable number of cameras associated with it. Mm. Th this is uh, the uh, the Blue Wave standalone storage project in town. Yeah, that's correct. Understood. Yeah, and I think that. Uh, it's to Corey's point too. I mean, it's it's certainly something we can we're happy to look into deeper. Um, I think that with that site in particular, uh, with Blue Wave, it was a few acres, um, so it might just mean we have to expand our scope here. But uh, we certainly want to make sure that you know our our concern first and foremost is is safety. Uh, so we want to make sure you know that's that box is ticked. Um, I would think that the primary thing would be around your best system, not not so much you you you've got. Uh, enough uh, offsite 24-hour-7 um, coverage of the panels uh, and your other equipment. But um, as far as someone accessing the best system, uh, I, I don't see anything indicating that it is enclosed in any way. And we do have a camera on that equipment pad focusing on that. Um, I think it would be probably minimal effort to add more than one. Uh, we could certainly do that. Um, that's, that's a good suggestion. Um, and then if I might just, uh, just to clarify, Rob, if I could. So 
changing uh, the name of the camp to Pure Sky. Uh, is that, uh, to be clear, do you want that across all documentation? Because we, we've been provided some reports from third parties uh, that uh, we can certainly do easily on our side, but are you, are you requesting for all of those to be updated with the, the updated name as well? So, so these are documents that are important to, um, that are tied to the special permit. I see. So say, um, you know, your management plan, that's one where the name should be changed. Your operation and maintenance plan, that's one that should be changed. The emergency um, risk mitigation strategy, that, those, that should be changed as well. I mean, I just it. because those documents are crucial to operate in the site under the accordance of the special permit. Um, so if, for example, you weren't operating in regards to the um, management plan, um, that, that document would have to be updated in the future. So I'm going to give you a list of the documents that uh, need to be updated, and those are a few that are included. Um, these are documents that are essential to uh, operating the site in accordance with what was agreed upon with the board. And that's kind of a way to hold you guys accountable for operating under the purview of a special permit. Um, so it's important to update the name on those just so it's current. So for example, if you ever need something changed in your emergency response plan, you would have to come back before the board, most likely if they condition that to discuss it with them. So that's why um, I'm stressing the importance of doing that in those documents, um, just because, you know, they're going to be continuously updated, most likely, um, if anything were to change to the project after the permit was granted, if, if it was granted. That's helpful. I, I understand now. Thanks, Rob. Yep, no problem. Mr. Slobitar, you had a question? I was, I was just going to, uh, I, I never thought of somebody coming up to a fence with wire cutters and cutting in there because that's just not something I've ever thought of doing and didn't do as a teenager. But I know that there are systems for monitoring fences that work by electrical continuity and when a the fence is cut and the circuit is broken that there is an indication that something happened so if you have a fence all the way around the property you certainly have electricity on site that you know it's not like you have to do anything special so that might be something that you could look into that some somebody with wire cutters or bolt cutters if they cut it you would know right away because the circuit would be uh interrupted so it's something just to consider thanks it's a good thought i, I wrote that down we'll we will look at that are there any other board members with questions i have one other comment i i Primarily because I just got filled, I just had a requirement to fill out um, safety uh, information for the Department of Defense project I've got, and it uh, it required um, a listing of all of the personnel and telephone numbers, contact information, particularly the safety engineer. Is that something that you've already provided? For, um, I think that we have provided uh, a list of contacts, but for this project in particular, uh, it has not yet gone out to bid because um, we we're uh, you know, hoping for a permit to do so. And then we would seek to procure, you know, somebody to build the project, someone to maintain it longer term. Um, but as, as it's kind of relatively in the early stages here, we, we don't have uh, something like that. Um, Lockdown. That said, we we do have uh, vendors we do typically work with on other projects that most likely would be selected for this for various features, such as uh, you know, the remote monitoring aspect. So we could uh, certainly provide that for what we've used for other projects if that's helpful. If you could do that, please. Yeah. Sure. If there are no other questions from board members, I can open it up to the public. Um, so, uh, go ahead. Uh, yes, please. Uh, I was going to say we have um, one hand raised so far, but you have to. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there, Mr. Chairman. 
I was simply going to say if there are members of the public that wish to speak, they can use the raised hand function or by pressing nine if you're calling by phone. When you're rec recognized, present your name and address to the board. Uh, for the record, and all questions and comments must be addressed to the board, not to the uh, uh, petitioner. So, um, Ms. Brestrup has her hand up. I don't know if she has a question she wanted to ask beforehand or... or... I just wanted to make a statement that um, I think you need to press star nine, not just nine, if you're on the telephone. So that was something that was not included in that um, introduction, introductory statement. I just wanted to make sure that people didn't get left out because they didn't press star nine. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Rob, can you, I can't see whose hand yes. is raised. So we have two hands raised, Mr. Chairman. We have uh, Karen Tarlow and John Montanari who are um, sharing the same screen. Um, they raised their hand first. If you want me to, I can allow them to talk so they can yep. ask their- Yes, Sorry. please. Yep, all right. I'm sorry, we did not intend to raise our hand. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right. Uh, let me do that. And then we have a Jack Hirsch, who I can allow to talk right now. <clears throat> Mr. Hirsch. Hello. I'm, yep, I'm Jack Hirsch. Um, I live on Flat Hills Road in Amherst. Um, I have a bunch of questions, uh, probably that reflect my ignorance more than anything else. Um, the first one is probably a simple one. Um, on the second um, diagram that, or the second slide that you shared, um, or that was shared with us, it had um, the, the um, dates for construction, and it had permitting in 2023, and then it had a design phase, which was in 2024. So I don't understand how does the des design phase follow after the permitting? Shouldn't that be before? Well, we're, the questions are to the board, but I think I can give you a little bit of an explanation since this is something that I do in my business all the time. And that is that we, we do preliminaries prior to getting permits and, and permissions. And then after we get the final permissions, we go ahead and do the, the final documents. And I, I would assume that the petitioner is doing the same thing. So don't the final documents require approval also? The, if there are changes from uh, from the initial documents, there would be a, uh, a review and approval of those, but that'll probably be done by the uh, by the, the town and the building inspector. Okay. The fire department, whatever those, whoever is, is in charge of a particular thing. May I continue and ask some other questions? Yes. Yeah, okay, thanks. Why aren't all the wires buried? Why um, do the overhead wires go a short distance on the property and then get buried? Well, I, I'm I, always wondering why the utility companies don't bury the damn wires. It seems like it's just asking for problems when they're not. I, I, I can't give you a rationale for the utility companies. <laughs> I, I've tried to do that myself many times, and, and it, it's a little hard to determine. I mean, Mr. Chairman, if you want the applicant to answer any questions, you can let them. Um, it's up to you. Do you feel that uh, it'll give a good answer? I, I, I don't think that there's much more that the applicant would have to say as far as that's concerned. Okay. All righty. What about the initial part um, from Shutesbury Road? to the pole. That, it, that's really up to the utility company on how they want to set that up. Um, if the utility company told them to have it all underground, they would. But if the utility company says, I want it up above ground and then to go underground, that, that, that ends up being the utility company's call typically. I see, I see. 
Um, I also noticed that they said that the panels would last 30 to 35 years. And that really surprised me because everything I've read showed that um, the, pa the panels gradually de decline in their efficiency. And after about 20 to 25 years, um, they're, that's the end of their life. Um, and even the contract with Eversource is just for 20 or 25 years. So I don't understand the 30 to 35 year lifespan. I'll, I'll let someone from uh, the petitioner answer that. I, I mean, I, I, I've, got, I've got three projects, solar projects going right now. None of them are gonna last more than 25 years, so. So um, I'm happy to answer that. Um, the, the panels themselves are warranted by the manufacturer for 25 years. Um, that said, field studies have shown through uh, various governmental bodies like the National Re Renewable Energy Laboratories and, and such that uh, the actual degradation of the panel for the energy it outputs is somewhere in the order of half a percent to 0.6% a year. So, uh, for example, if you have a panel that's, um, that's up and mounted after 20 years, it's still going to be operating at, you know, 90%, 85%. Uh, of its of its original output, and because these are uh, encapsulated uh, products, they're uh, this aluminum framing with ethyl vinyl acetate, sheet, acetate sheeting on these modules. Uh, they're designed to be totally waterproof. Um, so unless there's something like a hail event or something physically comes and cracks that, you're not going to get any water damage that would actually cause the panel to degrade faster and um, be be you know uh, unusable. Um, so as it stands right now, um, one of the, the models that we run forward with with our projects is uh, assuming about 35 years, sometimes 40 years for the project lifetime. That's, that's interesting. The, um, the panels start off at what, about 18% efficiency? I'm happy to answer that. I, I don't want to. It's up to you, uh, Chair. Go right ahead because I, I think you're being optimistic. I'd love to hear how much how optimistic you are. That's that's a good question. Also, um, for the efficiency, uh, it does range depending on the uh, panel technology you choose, and I, I'll, I'll spare you the the weeds on that. But the technology we use, it's uh, each panel uh, the efficiency that it, it, it has in converting sunlight to electricity ranges about 18, 20%. Um, you can get theoretically higher than that, but it's more boutique cutting edge panels that aren't really commercial. Um, and the reason those efficiencies are, are where they're at is because um, based on the way these solar panels are, are set up uh, on sort of the engineering side, um, they only are designed to capture certain um, amount of the wavelength of the light that hits it that's a single band gap is what they call it um so that there's a theoretical max of what you can hit for efficiency i, I don't know off the top of my head what that is it's maybe like 30 percent, 33 percent um future panels might do more than one band gap and you can capture more of for example infrared light or ultraviolet light and that will uh, result in a higher efficiency panel but where we're at uh, technologically speaking with the panels that are commercialized um, we're at the you know eighteen twenty percent range right now. So after the uh, lifespan of say twenty or twenty five years, it's ninety percent uh, left, but it's ninety percent of that original eighteen percent efficiency. So the efficiency is actually pretty low. Um, let Let me ask another question about uh, Mr. Mr. Hirsch. I, I I appreciate your your questions, but we do have three other people who've got their hands raised, and um, I think we're going to have to move on. Okay, thanks. Thank you. All right, so next we have a Robert Mullen. Um, I'm going to allow him to speak. Uh, good evening. My name is Bob Mullen. I represent Fred Hulk, 317 Shootsbury Road here in Amherst. Um, can I ask, um, I do have a couple of questions. 
um, I, I saw some of the graphs and it went by kind of fast. I was trying to take notes. Could anybody answer, uh, I guess the board members, how many acres of land does this project take up? I'm um, doing that's 41 acres. 41 acres. Um, now this is for a special permit, correct? Yes. It is. Uh, could you tell me what conditions the petitioner must meet? Because it's not by right, it's by what the this zoning board would like to provide if, if they so desire. So could you kind of go over the conditions that the petitioner must meet? Because I'm a lay person, I'm trying to figure out, you know, what they have to comply with here. It it it's it is not um it is not a normal ZBA determination. It, primarily because the state has specific rules on the installation of solar in Massachusetts. And so the ZBA has a very limited role as far as deciding uh, various aspects of the installation. Or let me, let, I, I think I can probably say the installation itself. So while you could say it's not by right, if you take a look at the rules that Massachusetts has promulgated, it, it basically is by right. And could you tell me where I find those rules? Um, Rob, if you got... So um, there's some... Sorry, go ahead, Kurt. Chris. Give me a citation. Um, Mass that. General Law Chapter 40A, Section 3 would um, help you to some degree because that talks about the limitations of um, regulating uh, solar installations. But I also wanted to direct you to um, our zoning bylaw, our Amherst zoning bylaw, which has a section called 10.38, which is the criteria that the Zoning Board of Appeals looks at when it's um, deciding whether to grant a special permit. And in the application, um, the the applicant actually answered the criteria of section 10.38 to the best of their ability. So they're offering those comments to the Zoning Board of Appeals um, as potential findings that the Zoning Board could make in this case. So you might want to look at the um, application that's online and check out the section that has the answers to section 10.38 as part of that application. That will give you some idea of what the criteria are. Thank you very much, Chris. Appreciate that. Okay. One last question. Is the public going to be able to speak at other hearing dates or is this it? You speak other hearing dates. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I have no further questions right now. Thank you very much. Thank Great. you. All right. And then we have a Stacy McCullough had her hand raised. Ms. McCullough, could you give your name and address, please? Yes. Hi, I'm Stacy McCullough. I live at 26 North Valley Road in Pelham, and I'm the newest member of the Pelham Planning Board. Um, and I am here at the request of the chair, who could not make it, um, to express that the Pelham Planning Board is strongly disinclined to support cutting down forests in order to install solar because while we are strong solar proponents, we believe that there's better places than cutting down our valuable forests for that. Um, I understand what you mean about it being in a way by right, um, Craig, but or sorry, Mr. Meadows, but that um, that's evolving right now really quickly policies are being put in place by the state um, and the science is evolving to make sure that we protect our natural environment while meeting our net zero goals for 2050. Um, the Department of Energy Resources report that just came out recently um, said that to meet those, those carbon neutral goals by 2050, which is ambitious, we certainly do need a lot more solar. We need about 27 to 34 gigawatts of solar in the state, which is a lot more than we have now. Um, what that report did is they looked across Massachusetts and said, where do we have highly suitable places for that to go? If we only put it in highly suitable places, would we possibly be able to get enough? 
And the answer was a resounding yes. We have um, more than two times the um, perfect places with zero demerits on the suitability, of whether it's the electrical infrastructure, biodiversity, carbon sequestration. We have another four times the amount needed with only minor de demerits still considered highly suitable places to put solar. Okay. So altogether, we have more than six times the highly suitable places we need to put solar without cutting down 41 acres of forest. Um, so this science is evolving, the policy is evolving at the state level, and we on the Pelham Planning Board would really encourage you on the Amherst Zoning Board to make sure that you are consulting with the folks who are behind those evolving decisions and that you're taking them into account and that you're taking all the responsibility you possibly can to shape a project like this more fundamentally than just the details. Um, all respect to the petitioner, I think the plan you have, if it weren't for cutting down forest, you know, I wouldn't have a problem with it, but uh, the cutting down of the forest is something that that Pelham Planning Board is is really working to mitigate. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Meadows, may, may I ask a question? Absolutely. Um, so for the petitioners, um, just to piggyback on what Ms. McCullough was saying about cutting down the trees, were there any of the sites considered for this or was this it? Mm -hmm. So uh, a very good question. Uh, the, the reason this site in particular was selected um, is for the simple fact that the electric grid as it stands mm -hmm. today is uh, completely oversaturated. Um, it was built in such a manner that distributed generation wasn't foreseen um, in, when it was constructed initially. So the way we go about site selection is we'll look at substations and distances from substations um, to see, uh, well, to you know, try to determine what, what property is actually available to site a solar facility. But even so, even in that situation, um, oftentimes, even if it is a reasonable distance away, um, the, the grid is fully saturated. So to put a solar facility there, it would require sometimes not even upgrading the substation, but totally reconstructing the substation and be cost prohibitive. Um, that report that was referenced actually um, didn't take into account the current state of the grid or any economics for interconnecting into the grid, um, uh, which is unfortunate because I feel like it can give a, a false view of the potential that we have in the state. Um, but as it stands currently today, um, it were very limited to the sites we, we can select. So this particular property was selected because of its proximity to the substation on electrical lines that weren't already totally saturated um, that was available um, for us to lease. So. Thank you. All right, so we have uh, Michael Lipinski, Mr. Chair. Um, I can uh, give him speaking permissions. Yes. Please. Hi, my name is Mike Lipinski. I live at 167 Shootsbury Road, which is about as close as you can get to this project. Um, so obviously I have some concerns. I'd like to uh, comment on a few things that were said already th th this evening. One is this issue with the uh, interconnection. It's, it's kind of implied here that this is a good choice because it's we've got a transformer down the road, which is easy to connect to. It, it, in reality, it's going to cost them a couple of million dollars to run from Shootsbury Road to that particular station. And the reason why is because it's single phase wiring all the way up to the Wagner Wood operation. All of that wiring is going to have to be changed over to, to three phase wiring. That is not a cheap thing to do. It's very expensive, and it gives you a sense of how much money this company is willing to pour into this project. So keep that in mind. Another thing to keep in mind is this idea of forest and how much solar benefit you're going to get from it. One thing you haven't heard tonight is that you, there are 41 acres of forest that are planned to be cleared, 
But what you haven't heard is the fact that they plan to cover that cleared area with only 10 acres of solar panels. So what you have there is a four to one ratio of destroyed forest to solar panels. You've already heard someone comment on the efficiency of the solar panels. So this is the type of trade you're making on this particular site. It's a four to one ratio of destroyed forest to surface area of solar panels. Those same solar panels, if they were placed on, on uh, rooftops or on parking lots, would also cover 10 acres, but they would be destroying no forest. So it's something to keep in mind as far as the scale of this site and the trade-offs that are being made in the interest of this project going through. A correction I'd like to make is at the beginning, it was implied by the lawyer that there was a lot of input from the neighbors. They cited two Zoom meetings and a meeting where the, where the neighbors walked through the, the forest. I think it's important to know that very few people turned out for the Zoom meetings. I'm not sure if anyone did. And the people who showed up for the walk through the woods, which was done two years ago, there were a handful of, of butters. There were a number of Coles people and David Zomack. That was the last time there was any involvement by a butters. And that was about two years ago. So there's this implication that somehow a butters have had a strong voice in determining what's happening with this project. There's nothing could be farther from the truth. And the other truth is that this company has avoided on purpose letting the general public know what's going on. They held no general public meetings. Very few people in town know about it because they've kept quiet about it. There are people in the town offices that know about it. The butters know about it, but very few other people have. Um, I've contacted them to say, how about holding a public meeting where the community can actually learn about this and make comments? They're not interested. Staff members have contacted them, asking them if they'd be willing to do that. And they said, no, we're not interested. So you can see the tactic that's being used here. Keep it underground as much as possible. Yes, they have to conduct these formal meetings where people, have to, where people can talk in a very structured way. But as far as really approaching the community and really talking about the project and maybe talking about that four to one ratio of forest to solar panels, that's not happening. Maybe they will do it in the future, but so far they haven't. Um, just one tiny thing. Uh, there was a suggestion about an inspector coming in and checking on the uh, solar facility. And there was an offering of sending in a Coles Forester to be the person who checks on the safety of a solar facility. I think we might want to file that in the not a great idea a category. Foresters shouldn't be the people responsible for inspecting solar facilities. And one last thing, um, I noticed at the beginning, they mentioned that the Poland people were here and we haven't heard from them. We, um, and I, I think they're here for a reason. I'm hoping that the reason why they're here is to talk about the recent fires in Warwick, New York in June that involved the Poland centipede systems that are the same ones that uh, Pierce Sky is proposing to use both at Hickory Ridge and at Shootsbury Road. In case you didn't know, they had fires on two different facilities. The two different facilities used those same Poland centipede systems. The fires actually moved between cabinets, even though testing had assured people that that wouldn't happen. And it was enough of a problem combined with another fire at a different facility using GE batteries that the state of New York has just gone into this state of, we have to investigate, we have to see what's going on with these fires. So it was a big deal in New York state. I think it should be a big deal for the town of Amherst that the batteries that are being proposed to be used here two months ago were on fire at a different facility. So. I'll stop there. I'd love to hear from the Poen people. Maybe they can talk about those fires and fill in some of the details. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Meadows, um, Mr. Lipinski has said a lot, but I, I think he raised some valid points. And I'm hoping that the petitioners can at least respond to some of them, starting with the four to one ratio of force cutting down to what's been used for the solar panels. 
Uh, sure, I can I can uh, take that one. So uh, the 41 acres that are removed, unfortunately, it's not feasible to put panels side by side, as you can imagine, because there's a shading reasons. Uh, the, the reason uh, the approach was taken to space the panels the way they are is because the, the way these panels are set up, it's actually a tracking system where they are uh, kind of on their racking, as you can imagine, in the line. And as the sun tracks across the the sky in the day, they actually move to follow the sun to maximize the amount of uh, of light they can get, like a sunflower. Um, and so, um, so that's the extent uh, for how close we can actually put them together without having panels shade one another. Um, the uh, the entirety of the site will have pollinator meadow underneath it, not just on the panels. So it would be the forty one acres of pollinator meadow, um, but the the reference to the panels is essentially just the panel square footage, um, but space on those rows as is kind of required in what you've seen other uh, other locations. So, uh, uh, any other questions I should field? Can you, can you talk about the batteries and the fires? Sure. I would be happy to turn that over to the, the Powen folks uh, as they're able to address that more effectively than I could. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chair, Board. Uh, I'm Joshua Preeb, 3768 Summit Avenue in Ontario, Canada, Ridgeway, Ontario, Canada. Um, I am a project manager with Powen, handling the AMP, now Pure Sky, portfolio of projects. Um, as of right now, the incident that happened under, in Warwick, New York, is under active um rca with our company um we have a team preparing a document for local fire department um, the fire chief as it is not being released to public record yet um, i'm sure by the next public hearing um, we will have more information we can comment on what i can say about it um, is Anything that has been suspected as the issue that might have started the event. Um, these were first models off the assembly line. And we have addressed numerous um, issues that have come up and they have been engineered out of the system. Um, during the event, the surrounding community um, was safe from, from it there was no damage anywhere off-site to the community at all. As I said earlier, I, I, I would like to have a direct discussion between your company and the fire department to go over this. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Meadows. Um, and we have seen the comments from the fire department uh, we have already reached out to the fire chief. Um, you know, we've explained our our situation in this u fairly unique situation, right? Because um, Powen is still undergoing an RCA. And that's what they you know, root cause analysis. I, I think I got that right, um, Josh and Martin. Um, so while that is ongoing, they can't release that to, to the public because it is an ongoing investigation. Now. It is something that we are also concerned about, and should it not be a good fit for us, then we will, I mean, we're, this is still flexible. You know, we can still, we, we prefer to go with Powen. We have submitted our application materials with them. We are, we've worked with them on several other projects. This is a unique situation, um, but we are, you know, once it is the appropriate time, we you know, we will work with um, with the town and with the staff officials and with Powen to make sure that what we're you know proposing is safe, and it's not going to be a liability to to anybody. The other thing to know is that it is pretty, it is very far away. I, I read to you the abutter distances, um, especially from the uh, equipment pad. It's it's very far away, so the risk profile for this is already fairly low just because of where it's located. Obviously, the ZBA is going to take uh, 
whatever the fire department indicates uh, you know, and listen to the, the fire department uh, as to their judgment on on this. So that's that's why I'd like to have um, your Powan talk directly with the fire department. If you can't release a public document, then it, maybe this is going to delay our next meeting. We'll have to see. Yeah, and our hope is by the time we come back to the next meeting, we'll have all of the wetlands work situated and um, signed off on, as well as um, you know these outstanding questions with uh, the Powan Bess equipment. But we're 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 confident that it's not going to delay us much further, just because they are, you know, they they are actively working on it, and it is something that they are you know very concerned about, and it's a very high priority for them. So, sure. if, if I understand correctly, by the next meeting, you should have a findings as to what caused the fire. And if it is something that is an issue, you have a backup for a different source slash supplier. Move forward with your project. That, yes, that is, that is the plan. Okay. Mr. Chairman, we do have um, another hand that was raised from Lenore Brick, and then two other hands from individuals that already spoke. So I, um, to I can give Lenore Brick permission to speak um, and ask a question or to give a comment. Yes, please. All right. Hi, my name is Lenore Brick. I live on Strong Street. Um, and I, uh, I understand you have a lot of things to consider, um, but because the issue, because the uh, issue of the state was brought up, um, and because the initial presentation was about um, the the fact that this is part of a climate solution, I would like to address that in a less myopic view with a little bit more of an elevated view, because even though you have very specific jobs to do, I think you need this elevated view since, since fundamentally we're talking about climate here. Um, and I appreciate that the, the company and their staff and the landowner and everybody involved is just trying to do a good job and um, you know has good intention, but there's, but it's hard to know what you don't know. So that's what I wanna just say. Uh, the person who, from the Pe Pelham Planning Board who was cautioning you that there are things happening at the state level that need to be taken into consideration because you mentioned that there is state uh, law involved. As we speak, there are people in the state house and in administration that are struggling and trying to figure out um, how to meet these conflicting goals. So, so it was mentioned about the carbon neutral 2050 state goals, but there's also the climate goals in the forest as climate solutions, which is a new programming campaign. There's a healthy soils action plan. There's the resilient lands initiative and the Healy administration um, and the climate office now in Massachusetts is, is working on how do we protect our ecosystems and our forests and our farmlands at the same time as meeting those climate goals. That is a very uh, front and center strategy that is that is happening. And if you go ahead and, and start permitting things that are at odds with that, you're not gonna be able to take back any decision that wasn't in sync with that. The Dewar study, by the way, that, that was referred to um, the, the statistic was that we have in Massachusetts 15 to 18 times the, um, the, the solar energy potential to use disturbed lands um, than, than we originally thought. Um, even if that's not, even, even if there are considerations in that, that's still a lot of disturbed lands, green, you know, brown fields, gray fields, built landscape that we can consider. Um, let's also not forget in terms of the state that if the state wasn't offering subsidies 
that, by the way, are paid by us taxpayers, this and similar projects would not be pursued on forested land because it wouldn't be lucrative. And Christine brought up, I think, Christine, you were talking about the Dover Amendment. I think that's what you were talking about. The Dover Amendment is a law, an archaic law in 1985 that was about when solar was only about rooftops, not about forested land. And we were worried that a neighbor would think it was unsightly. And so that law right now is, is, is being scrutinized and made, and, and there are several pieces of legislation that have been proposed to strike that law from the Dover Amend Amendment. So, so we're not sure, right, that you have that law backing or that state backing right now with your permitting process. And that's something to take into consideration. And then if we, if we zoom out a little bit more sort of into the international community of climate scientists, forest ecologists, conservation biologists, indigenous leaders, the people that are really on the cutting edge, the, those people are talking about taking off all green lands off, thinking of that as non-negotiables because you're not gonna get those back. And there is no other better um, uh, resource that we have for climate resilience and climate mitigation. That's our original green energy. And if we're really uh, interested in helping to regulate the climate, like really then that holistic strategy needs to include conservation, solar and built landscape and regenerating and protecting forests and greenlands. So when the original presentation, and I appreciate you know, the effort that's gone into this and trying to see where these different camps meet, but there's pieces of information missing, which is what makes it myopic is those calculations comparing carbon sequestration to of uh, in forested lands to solar protect uh, uh, potential doesn't include the consequences of soil disturbance doesn't include that 50 percent of the carbon is stored in the so soil doesn't include what's the what the consequences are for the present and the future doesn't consider the destruction of the microbiology in the soil so all of this are things that we're just learning about right now in the way that nature has already uh, has been regulating the climate for millions of years and doesn't consider the need for healthy forests for, for just climate resilience alone with all the increasing floods and drought that we're all experiencing. We know this, we're living through this. And so we need to consider what are our non-negotiables when so we have a little bit more clarity and can take the most intelligent action going forward. Because again, once we lose it, we don't get it back. And I am not um, casting dispersions on anybody who's just trying to do a good job, but we really need to look at this from, from a zoom out view and then a zoom in view. And thank you all of you for your good work. Thank you for your comments. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, we have two individuals that already spoke who raised their hands uh, again. Uh, I don't know what you want to do in this situation. Um, they're the only two individuals with hands raised at the moment. And there's a, a third person who just raised their hand who hasn't spoken yet, um, a Janie Kalik. I can um, give speaking permission to if you'd like. Yes, please. All right. <clears throat> okay, good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and everybody's work. Uh, the, the meeting started out uh, with some questions about what the ZBA could and couldn't do in relationship to issuing a permit. And the chair mentioned uh, the limitations that a ZBA has uh, based on what we're now all familiar with is the uh, Dover, uh, so-called Dover Amendment, which, which gives uh, lots of opportunity for solar to be cited because of our climate emergency. However, the ZBA also has the responsibility uh, for the health, safety, and welfare of the community. And in this er uh, regard, I wanted to mention uh, this project is in the part of Amherst where 
where all of the residents are on private wells. And the private wells uh, draw from aquifers that are unknown. Uh, and a, the Water Protection Committee in town, as well as the Solar Bylaw Working Group, have both spent a lot of time thinking about how to imagine the need to protect residents who are on private wells if a solar project were to come in. Uh, the Water Supply Protection Committee did a, a white paper and looking at the town as a whole, 95% of residents use town water, but for the 5% of us who happen to be located right where this project would be built, uh, comments were made from the Conservation Commission, uh, and I'll just give you a little feel for them with a quote, the clear cutting of our watershed forests uh, will likely have an adverse impact on the quality of the drinking water supply. And there are many details of why the Conservation Commission administrator believes this to be true. And it has to do with uh, basic science of what forests do to help wa help with water and recharge. Uh, and the taking the trees out, you have a lot more water, but you have contaminated water as a result of that. Uh, the vegetation, soil, and waters are all interconnected. You can't take the trees out and expect the water uh, to remain clean and drinkable. Uh, the, the idea of replacing a forest with a storm water system that is not only going to manage storm water when we don't know how much precipitation we're going to have, but also that the residents in this area will have drinking water when the project is done. So this is something that needs to be looked at from the point of view of health and safety of the residents who are directly affected uh, by this uh, project. At a minimum, uh, we would ask the, uh, the project to install water quality monitoring wells, uh, not only because of the changes of the water quality, but also the possibility that the batteries, the chemical applications on the site don't actually contaminate the groundwater. So although there's much said about there's no leakage, but there are chemicals that are involved uh, in creating this project, starting with the herbicide that's gonna be applied uh, in order to establish this pollinator field. So I would ask the ZBA to look very carefully at the possibility that the risk to the water supply of residents adjacent to this project and possibly beyond the butters uh, could actually become unusable as a result. Uh, studies are not uh, substantial, but there's lots of reasons to believe in water and soil chemistry and science to believe that this project would put the water supply in this part of town at tremendous risk. So is this a risk that the ZBA wants to give to us, to the town, and what is what would the town intend to offer us if our wells are no longer usable? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Meadows, a couple of follow-up questions, if I may. So I, I did read that email that was forwarded by the, um, the plan department earlier to um, this person's point just now, and, and I did have questions on that. So um, what is your response to um, potential harm to 
the 5% that use well water um, in that area? And is there a commitment if, and to someone's earlier point, we don't know what we don't know. So if future studies are done and there's a discovery that because of this project, well water is contaminated, is there a commitment on the part of this project to say, okay, we are gonna do something for these residents? I can address that. Um, so we did do a study with a hydrogeologist to look at the the area and uh, looked at all series of wells in the area uh, to do an analysis of if there would be any effect from the solar facility on well water. Uh, the only conclusion that they, well, the conclusion they came to was that the only real impact that would ever be had to well water uh, quality or uh, amount would be if the bedrock itself was disturbed if there was some blasting that was to be done on the site, uh, which we were not planning to do. Um, the reason for that is because a lot of these wells um, have the water kind of percolate into them from the surrounding bedrock. So if the blasting were to change the aperture of the cracks of that bedrock, then it would, you know, theoretically could do something. Um, as it stands right now, it's it's kind of difficult to, to know what may or may not happen, but certainly if there was some sort of measurable effect on someone's well water and they were unable to get water, I think that we would we would be committed to helping deal with that. Yes. And have you guys done any research into potential, um, have you done any research in past projects where similar situation where people use well water, solar farm came in, have you looked at those and to see how those have been impacted? Um, we personally, as a company have not, I'll have to look at the research for that. Um, I do believe that the mass DEP, um, has, has looked at this, I want to say back in 2011, uh, where they were looking at, uh, zone one, zone two quality, quality wells, and then did determine that solar, um, was not seen as having adverse impact on, uh, those wells being in proximity to that, but we can certainly look into that. That's a valid question. Thank you. So Mr. Well, Chair, sorry, go ahead. What else do we have? So we have three individuals that already spoke, Mr. Chair. I don't know if you wanted to give them a second chance to talk again, it's up to you. Um, otherwise we can move on. Uh, if we can limit it to one minute for each person. Okay. And uh, first up is Michael Lipinski. I will give him speaking permission. Uh, Michael Lipinski, 167 Shoots Bay Road, speaking very quickly. Um, I don't know how many of you feel very reassured by that answer about the batteries. I know I don't. Here's what I heard. Warwick was like our field test for the first units coming off. And guess what? They flunked the field test. Warwick still has a huge number of those batteries that were the first ones off the line that are still in place. You're hearing what happens when an accident occurs. There's investigations, there's reports, there's trying to figure out who did the bad thing. Was it the battery company? Was it the contractor? Was it the owner? There's a lot of finger pointing that goes back and forth. In the meantime, the, the batteries just sit there and whatever's in the batteries will leak out. This is a huge problem. There are other problems involving AMP that we'll fill you in on whenever we meet again in October. But I know I personally was not reassured to hear that, oh, there's a problem with those batteries. We're working on it. Don't worry. And then an AMP person saying, well, don't worry about it. The batteries are far away from your house. I think any battery that's on fire at Amherst should be a concern to everyone in Amherst, no matter where it's located. And that's all I have to say on the topic. Thanks for giving me a second chance. I appreciate it, guys. Thank you. All right, so we have um, Jack Hirsch. Hi, I'll also be quick. Um, thanks a lot for recognizing me. I still live on Flat Hills Road in Amherst. Um, I wanted to give you another perspective, and that is, is that um, solar panels are still in a somewhat developmental stage. 
people think, oh, this is great. We can harvest um, light from the sun and create electricity and it um, gets us off fossil fuels. Well, that may be true, but it has a huge footprint and land on our planet is also very valuable. There are many, many um, areas of research, including a company in East Hampton, if you wanna look them up, that are looking at alternatives to producing clean energy that don't require such a big footprint. So let's say in 10 years, one comes along. What are we gonna do with this cleared land and this obsolete solar panel, solar panels that are spread out over 41 acres? So please consider that miniaturization is also a very likely thing in the next 10 years. There are a lots of opportunities to do it better that are coming down the pike. And so I think that's something that you should also consider when you think about um, this installation. Thank you. Thank you. Then we have um, Jenny, Jenny Kalick who just spoke. Um, I'll give her a quick permission to speak. And then that's the last person with a hand raised. Thanks, Robin. Uh, I'll be very quick. I just wanted to uh, respond to Andrew's point. We don't really know. Uh, yeah, that's our drinking water. Thank you very much. And thinking about solar and their effects on water is a different prospect when you're uh, removing 41 trees and building storm water where there'll be an infiltration system, which in a way infiltrates dirty water back into the groundwater. So we're not just talking about one aspect. We do need uh, to know that we don't know a lot about this, but there are reasons to be concerned. The only other follow-up I did have is, it's not just a fire, but the fires create toxic fumes. And in some of these cases, people have had to be evacuated or shelter in in place until the fires were were put out. So it's not just the idea of the fire jumping to your house or to, to the um, forest nearby. It's the fumes as well. Thanks for the extra time, I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Do you have someone else, Rob? We do have one more person who is a new speaker, uh, Mr. Jeremy Anderson. I can um, give him the floor. Oh, uh, thank you so much for, for giving me uh, an opportunity here and continuing with Wells, uh, Jeremy Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson, could you give us your name, full name and address, please? Yes, Jeremy Anderson. I live at 34 High Point Drive in Amherst, uh, in North Amherst as well. And I think like many of the other speakers, uh, very worried about the well water and not just, uh, as, as was mentioned, um, the flow and, and making sure that there's sufficient well water but also wondering what type of contamination might come in from the routine maintenance to the solar panels, uh, cleaning the solar panels, herbicides in between the rows, you know, type of that, that infiltration into our, our drinking water, what type of testing will be done and provided to uh, citizens? Is that gonna come out of my pocket every time I have to test the well water or is that something that the, the town will be doing as well? Okay, well, thank you very much for your comment. Um, are there any other nope. that are asking for comment? No more uh, public comments, but Mr. Chairman, we do have to do um, uh, one more thing tonight. We have to establish a date to continue this public hearing to, and we have to establish a date for a site visit. The applicant has informed the town that they uh, would plan to do a site visit over the next few weeks. Um, there's a lot they have to do on their end to coordinate that. Um, so uh, I think the board should consider looking at their calendars and uh, we can pick those two dates. And then afterwards, the board would have to vote to continue the public hearing if it so desires to, to that future date. 
Um, it's looking like that's going to be the case tonight um, for what I see, but uh, I just want to suggest that we should do those two things um, while, we, while we're here. Um, so I guess the board, if they want to do the site visit portion first, um, Corey or Andrew, um, is there a time that works for you as the applicant to coordinate um, a site visit? Uh, thank you. I, I think I, uh, if it's okay with the board, uh, I like to just look at our calendars and try to, if it's okay to coordinate that offline. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I don't want to potentially put the board in a difficult position if we put a date out there and then for some reason we have to waste all your time or move it. And the, the other thing, Rob, is we'd like to make sure that the right members from our team can attend as well. And mm -hmm. we're just not sure about their availability. So um, if that's something that you and Mr. Meadows and Andrew and I can work on, um, we, you know, we, we just want to make sure that we've got the right folks uh, to join us for that visit. If you could propose three or four dates and times, and then um, we can take a look at those dates and circulate it amongst the, the board and find out which one is going to work for everybody, or at least most people. I would say avoid a date when there's a, a ZBA meeting taking place uh, the second and fourth Thursday of every month as well. So keep that in mind. Uh, right. Because we will have other site visits also. Yep. Um, now, as far as we do have to pick a date certain for the next meeting. And um, I'm thinking that it probably is going to end up being in November. Given the fact that you've got you have prep time the, to get your conservation uh, commission material together, get it to the conservation committee commission, get that get on their calendar, um, and then for them to to give us a recommendation. So uh, by the time we get finished, you get finished with all of that, and because of some other conflicts, I think we're talking about sometime in November. So, Mr. Chairman, the first meeting um in november is november 9th um i don't know if that works for the other board members in terms of a date to to set the next hearing to uh, i i'm in new orleans new orleans okay um in, I have, well could i just for for quickly if you know i heard mr meadows mention earlier the likelihood of a potential peer review for mm -hmm. this and just thinking about the timing of all of this, right? If we kick it over to November and, and wait for the whole conservation process to be done, whenever it happens in November, then the board's going to go out to get, a, they're going to vote to say, let's have a peer review. And then the peer review isn't going to come on board until, you know, potentially late November, beginning of December. And so then before you know it, we're in January, where if, if we accelerate it a little bit and have a meeting in October, ideally, you know, we'll have a, a good sense of what's happening with the Conservation Commission as far as um, our uh, wetland scientists, the Conservation Commission's peer review, and the conservation agent, understanding where those wetlands, the boundary, the resource area boundaries are, and then whether or not that's going to materially modify the project. But if we can check in in October and maybe get that peer review process go going, I mean, that quite literally saves a couple of months, especially because of Thanksgiving, Christmas, et cetera, for the other holidays. So for what it's worth, we would ask for maybe an October date um, to, to keep this process moving. That is up to you as the board to decide that. Um, you can discuss amongst yourselves. Mr. Chair, it may make sense because if we cannot do November 9th, the following Thursday is Thanksgiving, and I don't think we're going to meet on Thanksgiving. I don't believe so. Yeah. But. Uh, so maybe the 26th, October 26th, the last Thursday. I'm in Orlando. Let's see. And I, I don't, I, I cannot imagine that they're going to have it ready by October 12th. I mean, we could also um, do it on a date that's not a normal scheduled ZBA meeting night if the board would want to do that to be more flexible. Um, Greg, are you gone that entire week on the 26th or are you? Uh... I am. Okay. 
Mm. And I'd say if we meet the 12th, and it is just for a peer review to, you know, we can give you an update of where we are relative to the Conservation Commission, what we've found from the delineation. And then there can be a discussion of the peer review and you can, if, if it is the board's inclination to have one hired, we can at least start that process and then, you know, allow us to continue to work on those plans. And by the time you get the peer review hired, then we'll have likely a set of plans for them in earnest to review. So, you know, even if it is the 12th, it doesn't have to be material or substantive. I think it will help move the process along. Uh, Chris, uh, if you could chime in here. So the only thing is October 12th, we have a potential 40B project that might be scheduled for that night. Uh, Chris, I don't know if you want to talk about what the flexibility could be with that. I think you're muted, sorry. <laughs> um, the 40B process has a certain number of days um, in which to open the public hearing. I think we have, what, 30 days or something like that. So days, yep. um, we could possibly work with the applicant on that project since that project hasn't been submitted yet mm -hmm. um, to schedule this meeting for October 12th. Okay. So basically what we're talking about is an interim meeting on October 12th, because it's certainly not going to have all of the final information that we're going to need. Um, does an interim meeting make sense? I, I, I'm asking a question. I don't know the answer. Yes, Chris? I think it makes sense because by then um, each individual uh, member of the panel will have developed a sense of what do we need more information about. And there's potential for needing peer review on other things besides the things that were brought up today. So, um, you know, you, you can take that time to think about that. And then when you come together, you'll also have Steve Judge back on October 12th. Um, and then you can have a conversation about all the things that you might need peer review about, and you can move forward with that. And I do agree that the CONCOM issues won't be completely resolved by then, but at least we'll be farther along with them and we'll kind of know where we're going with the Conservation Commission. So I think it's a good idea to have a meeting on October 12th. And does October 12th work for the other board members as well? It can be available on the 12th. Mr. Slobitar? I'm I'm also available that night, yes. Mr. Gilbert? Taking a peek at my calendar right now. I'll take a peek at my other calendar. Did Mr. Henry say he was available then? Yep. So the the 12th, it looks like I'm clear. Cool. Okay. It sounds like it, it is the 12th good with, with everyone else. The petitioner. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So now the, the board has to vote to um, formally continue the public hearing to October 12th, 2023 at the seven, sorry, 6 p.m. ZBA meeting. <laughs> so moved. Wait, do I do that? Can I do that? So Craig yeah. has to um, start the, the oh, motion. Craig, he has yes. to ask. Okay. So we did we have a second? Aye. Okay. Um, then I will uh, ask for a vote to continue the public hearing for October 12th on uh, ZBA FY 2023-18. Um, the chair votes aye. Mr. Gilbert? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Slovater? Aye. Great. Thank you very much. Do we need uh, a adjournment? Oh, I'm sorry, what did you say? Adjourn for the evening? Uh, so there's, uh, you have to go through the rest of the agenda oh. items first, okay. and then, um, and afterwards you can adjourn. <laughs> you didn't finish my dialogue with that. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any other business that uh, has not been brought before the board tonight? From uh, 
none, none that I can think of, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Bresher, I don't know if you have anything you wanted to bring up to the board while we have everybody here. Well, I think it would be a good idea to mention um, what you mentioned before, which is that we do have a 40B application coming, and we've been told that it is coming soon, possibly by the middle of September, and the clock starts ticking as to how long you have to hold a public hearing, which I believe is 30 days, which is why we had chosen October 12th in the first place, but we don't have that application in hand yet, so we can't, it's not a bird in the hand, it's two in the bush, so... Um, Anyway, that is coming up, and it may cause us to reach out to you to find a, a date for scheduling that public hearing. Okay, that's it. Okay. I'm sorry dates are so difficult as far as I'm concerned, but that's life yeah. for me. Okay, do you have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Mr. Mr. Henry, you're a convenient second all the time. Yeah, I, I or am. a first. <laughs> I second that motion. Very good. The chair votes aye. Mr. Gilbert. Aye. Mr. Henry. Aye. Mr. Sloviter. Aye. We are adjourned. <laughs>